to Believe. My name is Nicholas Upchurch. Our website is believe.love. Our iTunes is believeitunes.com. And of course, you can find us on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash believe loves you. We're going to help you today with money and business. We're going to help you with true success and maybe a little bit of world news. And I have to say, there's so much going on in the world uh, today. This will be this will be of interest to our guest. He's a really well-qualified guy in actually many areas, and we'll, we'll bring him on in a second. But I did something today called Redirecting Self-Therapy, The Biology of Emotions. You can, you can read about it at gocure.com by Ellie Van Winkle, a retired neuroscientist. And I want to read you from this PDF just quickly uh, from the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. So suppressing anger can cause actually toxicity in the brain. And I'm going to be honest, today there's so much going on in the world, I actually had to utilize what was in this PDF to just get things out even before, before doing this show. You know, money and, and everything can kind of build up inside of us, uh, concerns with the world and people protesting and we're going to bring somebody on who's so well qualified to handle all this, to, to help us with this stress, to, to help us with investments, with money, with what's going to happen with the economy and maybe Donald Trump and things of that nature. So I want to welcome Chris Martinson to the program. Chris, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well, Nicholas. Good to be with you. Good to be with you. So Chris is a PhD. <clears throat> he studied at Duke. He's also an MBA at Cornell. I know he's a, a scientist probably first and foremost. He has a website he co-founded called peakprosperity.com. Chris, tell us about sort of, I know you're into not only, you have quite a story. You you started out um, when you were 50, actually, you terminated your former high paying position. It sounds like now you're into the richness of your community. You also were able to make a lot of money. In terms of true success, what is your mission over at Peak Prosperity and how can people not only prosper in terms of business, but really, really sort of achieve that true success of happiness with all of this, what's going on in the world today? <laughs> well, that's certainly a big question. So uh, let me frame this in, in my own personal narrative, just sort of ground it a little bit. Sure. Uh, the, the before and after story for me is that before I came in contact with the information that's now dominating and fulfilling the mission of peak prosperity. I was a regular guy, uh, maybe overeducated, uh, worked my way up to vice president of a very large corporation. And uh, somewhere around 2001, I had this moment of enlightened self-interest. I was getting crushed in the stock market like everybody. You know, I was a genius in the 90s and then I was a, a goat in the early 2000s. So I started asking some questions. I'm a curious guy. I'm a scientist by training, which means I like data and, and uh, had enough business to love a good story too. So once I started unraveling what was really going on in the economy, I found things that shocked me, uh, really that pointed to this idea that our economic model was unsustainable. And that was just economically speaking. And then I started working with the story a little more and I was really searching for something on the internet I couldn't find, which was the context to help make sense of what I was seeing in the world. So I kept digging. Soon enough, I'm giving talks in church basements and I'm haranguing friends and family. They didn't want to hear this story anymore where I was saying, look, people, there's something here that doesn't add up. And it wasn't just the economy, which is one E in this story. I started adding in a second E, which is energy, and then a third, which is the environment. And I put all three of these into a into a comprehensive story that led me to quit my job, change how we educate our children, move from one area of the country to another, uh, who my friends were, what I did for my avocation, everything. So, you know, when I was 42, I quit a very high paying job in order to start a blog. So nobody listening should take any career advice from <laughs> me. I'm just, I am not that guy, right? Well, you made it, it very successful. Out. Yeah, it all worked out. It's actually, I'm now one of the most fortunate people I know because I get to do something that I really love, that I find fulfilling, that is very deeply meaningful, and uh, which which is uh, pays the bills. So so I've managed to put it all together. And peak prosperity is about trying to share that one, the context which says, look, this world is really changing very rapidly and not for the better in all cases. And if you don't understand why, you'll be shocked and confused. I see a lot of shocked and confused people out there. So part of our mission is kind of educational, 
But it's not just understanding the context and saying, oh, yeah, crazy change is coming. Useless, unless that leads to actions. Actions that don't prepare you for some weird dystopian future that may or may not come, but actions that prepare you for almost any future that come, but which make your life better today. So that's our, our mission is educating and then taking action. But these actions have to make sense under any circumstance. Wow. So you also wrote a book called Prosper, How to Prepare for the Future and Create a World Worth Inheriting. So what is going on in the world and what are some of the action steps people can take to sort of prepare both economically and in terms of, and of themselves of having a fulfilling life that you might recommend people take? Well, look, um, I focus through the economic lens a lot, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, pretty much anything that we want to accomplish in life, we're going to do economically. And that's individually true, but collectively true as well. So let's imagine for a moment that we say, wow, Elon Musk has made some pretty sexy cars, and we think we should all be driving electric cars, and that's a great way to go. Well, you are not going to have any of that come true unless we have enormous amounts of capital and money and financial systems that are operating and an economy that can deliver really complex things to a factory in order to even build a single electric car or the batteries or the transmission grids or any of that stuff. So part one of this story is that we have an unsustainable economic model in the United States, but kind of globally. Sure. And what I mean by that is it someday it breaks if we continue down this path. I don't care who's president or not president. It's this is way bigger than than any party all of that. People need to understand that what we, in the United States what we've been doing is we have been borrowing at more than twice the rate that our economy has been growing since about the mid to late 80s. And you can't do that forever. Well, we had a warning shot across the bow in 2008. We've decided to collectively ignore that and just print, print, print more money. All that's really done is enrich the already rich. Um, and it's created a very unstable system in what we need to understand ecologically, economically sure. as well, of course, and then also in the energy side, that there are budgets that we have to live within our means. And, and that hasn't happened. So I want people to understand that and say that the first thing you need to do is understand that this is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. It will change. Don't worry. There will always be an economy. Go to Fort Leavenworth, max security prison. There's an economy operating even in there, right? So we'll always have an economy, but you're going to have to understand that our money system is breaking down for really obvious reasons. And, and here, here's a quick way to put this in context. Last year, a study was run and discovered that 62 people, just 62 people, had as much wealth as half the world's population. They just ran that study again this year and discovered that just eight people have as much wealth as half the world's population. Wait a minute. How did we go from 62 to eight? It's a feature of the money system. It's exponentially spiraling out of control. It's central banks printing because they just can't bear to look at the reality of the situation. Nobody at the high end is facing reality. So that's why it's up to you, the individual, to face that reality, not on your own, but with your fellow people, your neighbors, your colleagues, the other people who are now banding together around this idea that not only are we supposed to be doing things differently, but actually we really want to start doing things differently for our own sakes. Yes, Chris. And you originally, you know, you're a scientist. I believe you studied uh, neuroscience or something to do with the brain. And if you look, so the first step is becoming aware, understanding what's going on, understanding this is unsustainable. And I agree with you. You know, we can't run our lives. We couldn't run our households like the government runs the budget and go trillions and trillions in debt. And even Republicans uh, that took over Congress that said they wanted to balance the budget and do things like that. They didn't do it. And I think that's part of the reason Donald Trump won. And then we have half the country now thinking no matter what that, you know, they're tying um, maybe sometimes balancing the budget into not caring about people. And, you know, I think Republicans in the past maybe gave them a reason to do that as well. So as a scientist, as somebody who's dealt with actually, I believe, studying chemicals in the brain, you know, I mean, literally, what can people to do do to feel better about money and their their life and sort of having having a chance at prosperity and in success in this environment? 
Let, let's start with the, the simplest thing anybody can do. Look, if you are feeling, as many of us do and I do from time to time, if you're feeling anxious, mm -hmm. anxiety itself, something bordering on panic sometimes, right. uh, anger, if you're feeling one of those strong, dominant, fairly dark, intense emotions, there's a reason for that. And mm -hmm. the reason that we've discovered and worked with at Peak Prosperity is that there's a gap between what you know and what you're doing. Fear and anxiety live in that gap. So an example might be somebody who walks around with a low level of anxiety, maybe pretty low because they live in California and they live right on top of fault line. They know it's going to let go someday and they haven't even taken the 10 minutes and hundred dollars it would take to put a 36 hour emergency kit into their closet. So that anxiety is just sitting there because you know deep down, particularly on the masculine side, if you are not providing and protecting for your loved ones, it's kind of encoded somewhere in our in our genetics that this is something we should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, but whoever you are in this story, if you are not taking steps that align what you know with what you're doing, you're gonna you're just gonna feel awful about that. So guess what? There's so much we can do to begin to align our actions with our knowledge. We can't go the other way. We can't unlearn stuff, right? So you know, here's a quick example. Uh, we just found two weeks ago that the rusty patched bumblebee is now on the endangered species list. Wow. And that's a bad sign. Like that hits me right in the gut. That one really bothers me. Yeah, I get very upset when I hear about black rhinos, you know, becoming extinct. But you can't in this, you know, in the United States, you can't take a dominant species like the bumblebee, which is the only species that will pollinate many things which means that if you take that species out, those things don't get pollinated. And in one single growing cycle, they are now also extinct. And I'm talking about stuff like watermelons, tomatoes, and a, and a thousand uh, you know, native species that people aren't even aware of. And so that this thing gets put on the endangered species list is, is crazy making. It should not, that should not be happening. In Europe, they figured out what was happening to their bees. It's called neonicotinoid pesticides. They're awful. So how do, how do I as a person do anything about this? Simple, buy organic food. Do not support the industries that are busy killing the linchpins of our ecosystems. Don't do it. It's very easy to do, but first you have to have the context. You have to know what's happening and why, but it's completely unacceptable to me now that we are in the business of being participants in the sixth great extinction. The second thing you can do more direct, which is things I do is, um, this picture behind me is, is I wanted some greenery because it's Massachusetts in, in, in February. But this is my garden uh, from earlier this year. So I plant things specifically so I can eat them, so the bees have habitat and, and food. I plant things specifically for bumblebees, wild bees, mason bees, you name it. These are all things that, that align my actions. Now, will these be sufficient steps to save a bumblebee? No, I'm a just one guy, but they're necessary. So we talk to people about necessary, but perhaps insufficient. It doesn't matter if you alone aren't going to be the person who saves climate, you know, the climate from carbon dioxide because you drove a little less, but it's absolutely necessary that we all become the change we wish to see. And it's no longer sufficient for people to worry without action. But you know what I see, Nicholas? I see people getting more and more and more worried because we're headed in the wrong direction and they don't know what to do about it. And my whole work in the world is to say, not only can you do stuff about that, not only should you do stuff about this, but there are many easy, simple things you can do. So do them. Sure. And of course, you can hear more about that at peakprosperity.com. And with Chris's book, Prosper, How to Prepare for the Future and Create a World Worth Inheriting. I recommend everybody buy that. And Chris accurately predicted the uh, stock market correction years in advance and the housing collapse in 2008, which I I was sort of, I was very young at 27. I had five condos. I got wiped out on that. So <laughs> thank you. It's actually, I have to see it as a gift now, but it was a mm -hmm. tough gift to, uh, to go through. But again, we're talking to Chris Martinson of peakprosperity.com. He's been on the Rich Dad radio show with Robert Kiyosaki, RT show, Boom Bust, the Glenn Beck show, National Radio many others his uh his insights are in demand uh they you know i think he's he's spoken with the u.s state legislatures around the country the uk house of commons so he's a really well qualified guy so chris i have to know in terms of money and business is donald trump going to ruin the economy or help it grow 
<laughs> well, there's not a lot he can do at this point, given the larger trends in play. So let's look at just one statistic, totally independent of Donald. Um, and uh, it's this. If you add up all the debt in the country, people might be familiar with the fact that the United States federal government is carrying $20 trillion of debt on the books right now. But that's just a piece of it. Uh, states are carrying debts. Uh, we have student loans, auto loans. So households, individuals are carrying debt. We add all that up. But wait, we're not done. There's also liabilities. Uh, a liability is something you owe money for, but the bill hasn't come due yet. Uh, you might look at a child you have, their future college costs would be a liability. You, you either save for it or it really smacks you later. So we have unfunded liabilities or underfunded liabilities in state pensions, Social Security, Medicare, all that. You put all of that in a pile and you say, hey, how big a pile is that? And you discover that it's 11 times larger than our current GDP in this country. Now, the the most any country has ever managed to dig out from under a pile was just under 300% or three times. We're not at 300%, we're at 1100%. So these things won't be paid, they can't be paid. So can Donald remove a few regulations and grease a few things and maybe goose sector profits like you know deregulating the banks a little more? Absolutely, uh, but we're gonna be seeing just really temporary things. What we need to see is a long-term, what's the vision of this country? Now, here's what drove me nuts about both candidates was I didn't detect a vision, right? Make America great again, kind of retrospective. Stronger together is a statement description of a group of people. What I want, and the thing that I did as a, a when I was in business, I was a strategy consultant, right? It sounds fancy, but it's not. All you do with the strategy is you say, where are we going? How are we gonna get there? You know, what's the vision? What are our resources? We need to understand in this country that we need to have that kind of a vision and we don't have one. We need to understand where we're gonna be in the year 2030 or 2040 or whatever number we pick and say, how are we getting there? What are our resources? How much energy do we have to get there? And what should it look like when we get there? Donald is coming in with a lot of what I call more of the same. Hey, we're just gonna continue. We'd like to sell more F-150 trucks, but they should be built in America. We're tweaking at the edges of the story when I say, the bumblebee, the, the stuff in the atmosphere, the rising levels of uh, exploding levels of indebtedness, rising wealth inequality, all of these things say we have to start doing things fundamentally differently. And I don't see anything fundamentally different yet on this political landscape. Um, maybe next time. Sure. Or maybe he'll really surprise me, but I haven't seen it yet. Well, I voted for both uh, Barack Obama and Donald Trump. I'm very proud of both votes. And actually, I think Hopefully, you know, it's only been a couple of weeks. Uh, people are going crazy no matter what Donald Trump does, which is interesting. It's a whole, that's another topic. But I, I hope that, I don't think that long-term vision uh, maybe actually gets votes, to be honest. I think certain people, um, you know, if they want to win, they figure out what will allow them to win. And then hopefully, like you're saying, maybe, maybe they'll surprise you down the line, but it remains to be seen. But I'm hopeful. I think Things in terms of term limits and things that uh, might actually um, indirectly sort of force people to take action that are in, in the government and not just sort of uh, work as a lobbyist after they get out and sort of become employees of big business and things like that. I think that could possibly actually help in terms of shifting it from all rhetoric to, uh, to action in terms of balancing the budget and getting spending out of control. But there are big big issues like keeping Social Security and things like that that seem uh, almost uh, impossible um, given given what you're saying. So we'll see what happens. But I talked to MC Lobsher. He's um, president and founder of Valhalla Wealth, and he's interviewed people on his podcast uh, and his show, Jim Rogers, Robert Kiyosaki, you know, Nathan Chan, the, the, the uh, creator of Founder Magazine, and, and some really qualified business people and investors. And we were talking about recently the stock market and the real estate market and you know I, I was going to short the stock market three times last year because I'm looking at this graph and it, it seems like it's almost impossible if you just look at the S&P 500 over like 20 25 years you can actually see the you know sort of a trend it, it uh, basically anybody could look at it and think well what's going to happen next in this graph and it, it would seem like it's going to go directly down and then i didn't short the stock market thank god even when trump won people were saying to short the stock market now it's continuing to go up 
And what's going on with the stock market and the real estate market in your in your view? And what can people do about that? What would the average person sort of do with their money at this point? Well, let, let's start with the explanation. Uh, there's only one graph people need to understand for the stock market, which is to look at the balance sheets of central banks. Now, what does that mean? A balance sheet is a place where you look at the assets and liability of a corporation, central banks or corporations. Uh, and what they've done is they've printed money out of thin air, not just some, but $16 trillion of money out of thin air and used it to buy financial assets. Uh, so it's kind of like if, if you showed up at a farmer's market with a counterfeiting press in the back of your truck and started buying all the tomatoes, the price of tomatoes would go crazy at that farmer's market. Um, that's what's really been happening. So the question we first have to ask is, can the central banks politically continue to print more and more and more? I think they're kind of at the end of their run on this, and here's why. Uh, Brexit, Trump, Marine Le Pen, uh, the rise of, of, of the far right in, uh, and, and rightist policies in Germany, et cetera. What's happening is that the people, I'll call them the little people, which by the way, the little people's like everybody from the 99% level on down, uh, we're getting kind of hosed in this story and the top 1%, but really specifically the top 0.1% are making out like bandits, which is, guess what? That's what happens when you throw free money into financial markets. It's just, it's a thing. So the stock market has been heavily propped up by central banks that are either indirectly or directly buying the stock markets. Japan, they directly buy the stock market. Swiss National Bank buying stocks like Apple and whatnot. They are directly buying U.S. companies in markets. So, so central banks have been printing money out of thin air and buying stuff with it. Meanwhile, what hasn't happened? Corporations haven't been investing in R&D, which is what you get long-term growth. They haven't been investing back in in, um, in uh, workers at this point in time. We see it in the wage data, blah, 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 all this stuff, right? So what I'm looking at here is a stock market that's been heavily um, propped up by central banks who are scared, scared of having assets go back down again because they know the next time they go down, they get really scary. Now, listen, could it go up even further from here? You bet. Because here's where we are. We're in a late stage bubble, and this isn't a stock bubble. It is, but that's a side bubble. And it's not a real estate bubble, it is, but those are side bubbles. Uh, London housing, flat prices, Vancouver property, stuff like that. What we're really in is a bubble that, again, started 35, 40 years ago, where we started printing and borrowing and spending at a faster rate than our income was growing. Nobody wants to see that end. It's really a credit bubble. It's the one to beat them all. Bubbles take forever to unwind because they're really psychological phenomenon. They're not, they're not math problems. They're not financial issues. They're, they're psychological phenomenon. This is a really big bubble. It's gigantic. It's going to take a while to top out. Nobody wants it to break, not even me, but it's going to. What's going to happen? Do. When's that going to break? What, what do you think is going to happen? Hmm. I, I would I would give it a, a, a almost a hundred percent chance in the next five years. I would give it you know a decent you know some a non-zero chance of this year. So here's where the book Prosper comes in because we think that uh, that these markets are highly unstable. We think that they're rigged in many in many uh, instances, and we know they're rigged because there are companies out there who are high frequency trading companies who can turn in. 100% win ratios day after day. They wade into the markets and they wade out with hundreds of millions, if not sometimes billions of dollars a day, taking them out of the markets. Um, it's astonishing what they're doing. And anybody who's, in, who's a trader knows if you're winning 100% of the time, there's no risk involved. If there's no risk involved, it ain't a fair game, right? So just leave that uh, aside for a second. Um, uh, we think there's a lot of risk in this market. We think it can't be propped forever. So have your, your money and have it invested as carefully as you can. So if you have a, a, a blob of money this big, make sure that um, you invest some of that into your household. So in, in my house, I've made in what I call actual investments, like a businessman. Um, I put solar hot water heaters in, eight-year payback, 30-year lifespan, internal rate of return well in excess of 100%. No-brainer. Re-insulating, putting windows in. Again, these have very high ROIs in the double digits, 15, 18, 20 percent. So these are the sorts of things we would suggest people do with their money if they're a homeowner is figure out how to invest in ways that are going to be money today, but less money out uh, in you know future reduced cash flows and look at the returns off of that. Lots of investments people can make like that. 
Um, of the money you have, if you still have it in the market, now is the time to be investing with extreme safety. So um, we had, we recommend advisors who uh, really understand the risks, have very dynamic actual hedging strategies, um, maybe writing covered calls, puts, all of that stuff, just get the insurance in, but are, are actually not afraid to sit on reasonable cash positions at this point in time. Um, because you know sometimes the smartest thing to do is to take your chips and wander away from the table for a while if you don't like how the how the cards are going. So, uh, so we're we're kind of preaching safety and caution. And like you, we've been doing this um, for a while now because mm -hmm. we couldn't predict if the bubble was going to break two years ago, last year, or in two years. We don't know. But sort of the Hippocratic oath for investors: first, take no losses. So that's that's the financial capital side. But in Prosper, we identify seven other forms of capital that if you can build these up as well, you will be far more resilient. So financial capital, important, but just one of eight forms of capital to be alert to. And again, we're talking with Chris Martinson of peakprosperity.com. His book is Prosper, How to Prepare for the Future and Create a World Worth Inheriting. Chris, what you're saying really makes sense. I am I agree with you to sit on the sidelines. We had MC Lobsher, who's who's the founder and uh, president of Valhalla Wealth and, uh, you know, a great guy who talks to luminaries, uh, investors, and he thinks that we should sit on the sidelines in terms of money, keep everything kind of weighted out a little bit, maybe not catch the last, uh, the top of the bubble if it goes up a little bit more in terms of the stock market and the real estate market. So, Chris, if we're switching to world news and we're looking at, you know, in my, in my view, uh, the people at the top, you talked about in an earlier segment that there's now eight people with, uh, I think you said 60 to 80 percent of the wealth uh, in, in the world or something as like that. Mm -hmm. As much wealth as half the world. Right. So, so and, and there's another study by a Swiss scientist uh, at a university over in Switzerland that I think I believe 147 corporations control 80 percent of the world's wealth. So, I mean, judging by sort of the eight people, what you're saying, that that's very feasible. And so I, my, my view is that if we look at Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, you know, it was a, it was an interesting message. The problem is the people at the top aren't just maybe going to willingly just give up their power to everybody magically. And everybody is going to be treated fairly and become socialists. And, uh, you know, you know, you look at Venezuela. I talked to a girl in Venezuela. She makes a dollar a day. Um, and they don't even have toilet paper on the shelves and grocery stores. It's like, it's crazy. But I still think, and so I think Donald Trump actually, you know, you're dealing with some tough cookies there at the top of the totem pole. If you are seeking to sort of get things out in the open, you might need somebody like that to go in there and kind of, uh, kind of uh, get things moving, to put it nicely, but there, there are other words that might be used. But I still think working our way out of this with love, I would love to do that. It's tough because there are people that feel really, really taken advantage of over time. So in terms of world news, how do we, how do we use love to work our way out of this situation, which is, like you said, a huge bubble over 40 years, printing money, unsustainable debt. We have a division with political parties, but how do we use love to work our way out of all of this? Well, now we're getting to what I think is realistically the only true solution out there. So, so a lot of what we're advising people to do is once you wake up to the actual current conditions and, and the risks involved is put on your own oxygen mask, as it were, take care of some things. But, you know, you could get through that in six days to six weeks, depending on how fast you want to move. But now what? And quickly, you come to the idea that you're actually only as safe as your neighbor. And quickly, you're actually only as safe as your community, and, and if safety is the goal. But it should be more than that. Look, can we be honest here? The, in, in the United States, we are the most over-medicated, overweight, unhappy, over-imprisoned, deeply dissatisfied. 80% of people report that their jobs are unfulfilling, right? So we have a lot of things that if we were a Martian coming down, looking at this culture, we would say, gosh, there's some stuff here. Maybe we wouldn't rebuild it exactly the same way again. We would start doing things differently. And the, the data around the disappearing species and all these other things, they all say we have to do things differently, right? So if insanity is doing the same thing over <laughs> and over again, expecting a different result, right. we are insane. 
at this point in time because we're trying the same stuff over and over again. Let's just print more money. We just didn't print enough last time. Oops, didn't work again. We'll try it harder. You know, all of that stuff. So to get back to this idea of love, what I think from my analysis, we, we went down this experiment of really trying to do things in an extraordinarily masculine way. Mm. Let's break everything up. Let's reduce everything to the component parts. Let's, you know, figure out all the pieces and we'll just put the pieces back together and it'll work, right? What we're discovering more and more is that we need to be in relationship with the world, not just with the other countries out there, not just with each other, but with the bumblebees. Like there's a relational piece to this, which is missing in this story. And and so to get that relationship back, this is the most gratifying part of my work is to have the feedback from people. And we have thousands of people who've given feedback that's like this. They said, look, I felt like I was in the wrong place. I was on the wrong path. I got a little scared by all this data that we saw through you, through, through other sources. So made some changes in our life, took care of the basics. But now we're over here with this much better life than we had before. We know our neighbors a lot better. We know ourselves a lot better. We've started to take responsibility for our inner landscape um, and, and who we are as people that until we come to that form of compassion and is compassion for self first, others next, maybe all of life is a third ring when we get out there. That's, that's what love really is. So we're finding more and more that what we are facing as a species on this planet is nothing shorter than an existential crisis. And it's saying clearly we have to do things differently. So in the United States, I know people get a little upset when I say this, but the history is clear. The United States has been busy bombing, subjugating, and doing other things to other people That's for correct. a very long time. And it hasn't really worked. I don't think the world loves us any better or anything's any better. There's, you know, there's a couple ways to get there. It's sort of the, we, you know, security begets peace, right? Well, I was at a thing where Oscar Arias, the, the president, former president of Costa Rica, was talking, and, and he had it exactly backwards. He said that peace begets security, that you, there's two ways. You can try and subjugate everything until you get what you want, but look how that's working for us when we're subjugating the natural landscape and discovering that it's withering on us and that species are disappearing. What if instead we made our peace with things? And I've seen the models for this, right? There's a place in California, Singing Frogs Farm, multiple species of birds. They use no inputs, not even organic sprays. They have no insect pests, whatever. They're just being super clever about it. It's amazing to watch high quality food. It's astonishing. So here's where we are. We already know how to do things in a way that is in relationship with each other, the world around us. It works. It works economically. It works ecologically. We already have all this stuff, but we're not using it. I would agree. That's I, I would agree. I, I agree so much. I've worked with shamans in Peru. I've been to 33 countries. I've done millions of dollars in sales. I've had great losses, six-figure losses or more. Uh, and um, I would say that all the technology we need is within ourselves. I would say that we can um, we can love the things we can hate by loving what we hate about ourselves. And actually, you know, in terms of the feminine and masculine, if we might possibly understand that through love, we might encourage these men at the top with big guns and spending a trillion dollars a year uh, with the Pentagon and, you know, playing war games that, uh, you know, they're not, they're not just going to willingly give it up and especially not by force. The feminine has a great power in the universe, in our world specifically, by be, being able to maybe love the masculine, love their way out of it as opposed to, you know, acting like the masculine might act with fighting it with force um i think that might be something to think about it's a very tough it's very tough for me to do with myself uh but i would say that there are technologies you know nikola tesla is working on free energy over a uh, hundred years ago there are a lot of things that may have been suppressed you know dr royal rife dr uh, Wilhelm Reich, uh, I believe is his name, regarding orgone energy. I mean, there's things people can look up. Some of them have credence, some of them maybe not, but these technologies may have been suppressed due to money, and the people with the money, they may have been born into this system where they think they need to keep control, and I think the feminine has such a power to love that um, 
you know, they're made, you know, Donald Trump needs love. He doesn't need hate. It's not going to help everybody if everybody hates him. You know, he's the president now. I voted for Obama as well. I wanted him to create hope and change. I really did. So I'm proud to have voted for the first black president. I, that was my first presidential vote. So uh, I really love Chris's insights. And you can get more of them at peakprosperity.com. I recommend you check out his books. The links are there at peakprosperity.com. Again, I'm Nicholas Upchurch. Our show is Believe. We're going to help you make as much sense of everything as we can. And our website is believe.love. You catch us on iTunes. Subscribe at believeitunes.com. And of course, at YouTube, youtube.com forward slash believe loves you. Chris, thanks so much for joining us today, sir. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.